our first panel of the day on environmental justice and disaster response. All women. So, yeah, how about that? How about that? How about that? Let me introduce our speakers, and I want to start with our first speaker. Um, I know all but one of the people on the panel, but I just have to give Donna a special shout out. Um, Donna Chavis from, um, from uh, are you in Lumberton or Pembroke? Pembroke. 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 Um, which is the terminus point for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and two other pipelines, right? So um, hopefully she's going to say a little bit about that experience. But Donna um, and I have been friends for about 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I met Donna when she served as a commissioner for the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and was one of the people who helped us um, to oversee and to produce the landmark report, Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. And so um, the conversation about environmental justice is so grounded in North Carolina. But Donna is one of the people who has been lifting up this fight for a very long time. And I also want to give a shout out to her husband, the great, great, great Mac Ledgerton, um, and one of the true highlights of our very small denomination, the United Church of Christ. How a church that has less than two million people can have so many hell raisers in it is a, is a wonderful thing, but, um, but I'm really, 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 really glad that Mac and Donna and I crossed paths and that they have been on this path for all these many years. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to see. So Donna is with the Red-Tailed Hawk Collective, and she's also on the board of Friends of the Earth. Um, she's been a longtime leader in uh, philanthropy, particularly raising up the voices of women of color and indigenous women in philanthropy. Next is Ms. Yesenia Cuelo. Yesenia is an organizer with North Carolina Field. She's going to bring to us the voices of a population of folks that nobody is talking to, talking about, but is long-suffering farm worker communities um, here in North Carolina and elsewhere. Next to her is Marion Edelman Lago representing the Yale School of Forestry and Columbia um, University School of Law, Environmental Law Clinic, a long, long, long serving, okay, maybe that was one too many longs, um, <laughs> battler, fighter, environmental just, for environmental justice, but for civil rights. She was our first lawyer in New York for We Act for Environmental Justice in 1988, Marion Edelman Lago. Yeah. Next to Marion is Esther Calhoun from Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice. You are going to hear some horrifying um, uh, stories about what is going on in Uniontown, Alabama. But um, you are also going to see the spirit of the folks in Uniontown when you hear from Esther. Esther and I were once in a meeting um, with the, was that the Office of Management and Budget? the White House Office of Management and Budget, and we were talking about the coal ash rule, and Esther lit these people on fire. They didn't know, they had never heard from nobody at OMB like they heard from Esther. Um, Miss Leslie, uh, Ruth is gonna go next. Ruth Santiago um, from Comité Dialogo, Dial Di Dialogo? Dialogo. Dialogo, thank you. Um, ambiental, and also El Puente. Um, in the San Juan and South, um, Port South Puerto Rico office. Uh, as, um, Ruth is our colleague from Puerto Rico, who every time uh, we call, she would come to bring the voice of folks from Puerto Rico. And so we're going to hear what is going on in, in Puerto Rico. And then last but not least, Ms. Leslie Fields, Director of Environmental Justice and Community Partnerships for the Sierra Club. Donna, take it away. They each have 10 minutes to speak. And um, Ruth and Leslie are going to split minutes, so they have seven and a half minutes. Thank you so much, Bernice. Um, and we've already seen her in action, so I'm going to try to stay on point. Um, I have to say I began with a, um, a prepared statement that I had time to seven minutes, so hopefully I'll be within my ten minutes. But it has changed based on presentations I've heard. And I want to start first by saying thank you to uh, Jeff Anstead from the Halawa people this morning and to Mustafa because they said so many words that I had embedded in my presentation that I'm hoping I'll stay on time because I won't have to say those now. Um, but I also want to give great thanks based on comments of inclusion that Mustafa made at the end of his presentation um, to the planners and the producers of this event for the inclusion of the indigenous voice. Um, you heard um, Jeff speak briefly in terms of the um, invisibility of the people here in North Carolina. And so many don't know 
uh, the size of the population here. And I have to say that it has felt so affirming to hear the voices this morning, last night, and to be on the stage today, even though I'm a little more nervous today than I was yesterday. Um, so thank you all for that inclusion. Um, I am Donna Chavis uh, Lumby from Pembroke, North Carolina, and the daughter of Harvard and Gertrude Chavis. I stand on the shoulders of the ancestors before me, and especially those of the original people of these lands who you have heard named today. Um, I want to say that um, as, as this is not in my written statement, so um, as Bernice pointed out, uh, I have been working in the field of environmental justice uh, for over 40 years, um, actually predating the, the, the title environmental racism, and I appreciate all the association I had with the United Church of Christ with, uh, with that. Um, I, I hail from Robinson County, uh, Pembroke, North Carolina, where right now we are facing um, um, CAFOs, coal ash, Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and wood pellets. So all four of the major environmental justice um, uh, degradations that is facing North Carolina we have in our home territory. Um, Robinson County is the home of the most diverse rural county in the United States um, and one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. We are a tier one county as is most of the counties that are along what we call the Hurricane Corridor and also the ACP Pipeline Corridor. Um, it's no accident that that is the case. Um, six out of the seven state recognized tribes are being impacted by the ACP and now the MVP. And yet, as Ryan pointed out last night, um, it is stated that there's no disproportionate impact uh, for any population. In, t in terms of the, the roots of the pipelines. I want to share with you before I go to my written remarks, uh, and this is for especially the law students. Uh, another comment I made last night as um, Ryan was speaking was that we have such a shortage of attorneys who are in the American Indian law field. Um, it is so small, so much smaller than even those that are in the environmental law field. And so if there is any law students here uh, for environmental law. If you will pay some attention to American Indian law, it will be much appreciated. And I say that because in this country, um, as you know, um, there's efforts uh, every day to make the indigenous peoples even more invisible. And part of that is the diminishment of the territories in which they reside and in which the sacred lands and that happen to also be the home of many mineral sites um, continue to be cut down. Uh, some of the first actions of the current administration was to diminish the natural, the national forest. And so many of those lands are sacred lands to native peoples. So that it would be a great service to this country and to the world, I believe, if some of the environmental st law students would also consider dipping your toe into American Indian law, because what happens to us eventually happens to everybody. It's just the case, and I'm saying that from an indigenous standpoint, not just from a Native American standpoint. If you look around the globe, indigenous people are the front lines of degradation. Indigenous peoples are not only the front lines for deg degradation, though, they are also the front line for solutions. And that is what we are finding in our home territory. I want to call attention to two Specific things, though, for the law students and everybody else might be interested in it. One is the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People, which is becoming the standard rather than um, state or federal recognized or whatever the territory is in the globe. Um, UNDRIP is what it is called, and it is really becoming the major standard for what is being used in relationships with indigenous peoples around the globe. It was used in relationship to Standing Rock, and I, I say that hesitantly because people want to call everything the next Standing Rock, and yet everything that happens in indigenous communities is very, very specific <coughs> to that territory, to those traditions, especially to those sacred traditions. And so um, Standing Rock has been informative, and I believe it put the word indigenous into the lexicon in ways that had not been true before. But we have the, I'm um, being told now, I have five more minutes, whoa, I'm sorry. I will get to my written documents. I won't read UNDRIP to you, <laughs> but please Google 
UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, and also uh, Free Prior and Informed Consent, FPIC. Those are two very important, important um, um, things to understand as we're looking at indigenous communities. Now, I mentioned that I'm from Robinson County. 68% of the population is native African American or Latinx. Um, we are the most uh, um, diverse po uh, rural population in the country. Since 2016, Robinson County has experienced hurricanes Matthew, Florence, and remnants of Michael. In the fall of 2017, FEMA put a hold on recovery funds for North Carolina so emergency funding could head to Texas and Florida in the aftermath of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma, respectively. Now, I don't want to imply that those funds weren't needed there, but it's an example of rural communities such as those along the route in North Carolina being punished for being rural. That's our perception in terms of how the funds got frozen. In June 2018, 119 homeowners in Robinson County North Carolina, the hardest hit by Hurricane Matthew, were granted hazardous mitigation grant funds totaling $15.2 million. Over half of the homeowners chose for their homes to be acquired and demolished. And prior to any allocations, Hurricane Florence hit Robinson County in September 2018. Many of the same homes harmed by Matthew were damaged or destroyed again. And folks were told that they couldn't really even apply, some were told, because they hadn't done the Matthew applications yet. So we were hearing before in terms of the importance of place and space. And home ownership in this country is important. Uh, and so we're looking at communities along the hurricane route where homes are being destroyed and not being properly serviced through mitigation funds. Um, and in Robinson County, the Lumbee River has only been down four days since Hurricane Florence from flood stage. That is part of what is not discussed. The flood has not gone. The flood stays on. Uh, it's just going over the banks, thank God, and not hurting more homes. But the conversation moves on to the next dramatic incident rather than what is happening in terms of the efforts to bring people back together. Um, saving time for questions, I'm going to skip a lot of what I've written. And to say that um, elements of a community approach that are really important, that is not present now within uh, the uh, after effects of Matthew and Florence, especially in North Carolina, is a participatory process that include the most vulnerable members of society. Strengthening the capacities of local communities, linking disaster and development issues, and outsiders having a supportive facilitating and catalytic role. Those are related to what we have been discussing here, what I have heard at least from last night and tonight, and of how the impacted must be included in their own decision making. If you will Google FPIC and UNDRIP, you will find that not only it is an important methodology, but it is also a legal important act, uh, and one that we need to be sticking more and more to. Um, in the response to Matthew and Florence, the community people have learned more about their vulnerabilities. They have become more involved with learning what are the regulatory uh, issues they need to know about, how do they engage in the conversation, and attempting to challenge decision makers. Um, so that what we are seeing is a much more vital and active population post -Hur Hurricane Matthews and Florence. Um, they have become involved with water and air testing so that they can learn more about their own vulnerabilities around their health and how they can hold people accountable in relationship to that. Um, and I want to tell you a story. I'm not going to read it. But this is a story related to one of the early environmental injustices uh, in this country. In, the in 1900, there were less than 1,000 bison left in the United States. Prior to that, over, uh, the numbers had been over 60 million. And during the 19th century westward expansion, there was an intentional effort by the U.S. government to destroy the bison, which was integrated directly to the lives of all the indigenous peoples. And this historically has been seen as another form of genocide. It was bison genocide, but also it was the genocide of the people because they no longer had the clothing, the food, all the elements that was used in the animal. And so in terms of the current day, 
this has been seen as one of the first recorded intentional acts of environmental racism in the United States of that sort because it was an intentional desecration of a whole population of life form, the bison. Now what has happened is this is a tale of resilience also because as we know now through the organized concerted effort of native nations, environmentalists, conservationists, and even politicians, the bison has returned from the brink of extinction. This is an example of what can happen when an environmentally just practice prevails in response to disasters. Community, culture, and hope can rule. Thank you. I was under time by a minute. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure how close I need to get to this in order for this thing to work. Okay, um, so some of you guys went out into Duplin County yesterday. Um, did you guys happen to go through Pink Hill? Can we get a show of hands of people that know where Pink Hill is? Nice. So we got a population of about 300 people, one stoplight. I'm not sure that lets you know how rural it is. So it's a very small town. If you blink too long, you might miss it. Um, but I am... I lived in Pink Hill, but the thing is that I'm originally from California, so seeing the difference in between a very rural community and where I'm from was a massive impact. So with the hurricane, I do want to focus a whole lot of what I'm going to talk about today on farm workers and the farm worker population, regardless of whether we're talking about people that have come here with an H-2A visa and Latino people that came here with or that are here without an H-2A visa. Because technically speaking, what we saw was that the hurricane affected people um, throughout all of eastern North Carolina. And I'm a naturally very fast speaker, so if I'm talking really fast, just somebody let me know to like remind me to breathe and slow down. Um, okay, so the thing is, the organization that I work for um, has a youth group. And the thing is, that the reason why I'm here as well is the fact that we are talking about building resilience, especially within a farm worker community. So one of the things that we did over this past summer was that we um, and the youth group got together and we helped Latino communities start their own garden. So it's all about, you know, building again, building resilience, helping them start their own garden, eating healthy. Um, but with the hurricane, of course, um, it washed out a lot of the plants and a lot of the gardens that we started. So um, that's one of the issues that we've encountered. And then, um, sorry, I came here with a plan of what to talk to and then my nerves get to me and I blink out a little bit. Um, so a lot of what we saw was that whenever it came to the hurricane, some people did, they didn't know about the hurricane, they didn't know it was coming, but they didn't realize how bad it was going to be. So a lot of these Latino families stayed in their homes. Um, and well, what we saw was that they were having to get rescued by emergency and transported to the nearest shelter. Um, so the thing is, what we did um, as a community, because that's what we ended up having to do, is the fact that there is a lot of power in the community, and it was community members coming together, whether they were working or whether they were volunteering their time, in order to help provide services for these families. Because, again, it's a vulnerable community. Um, you have something, you have the fear of retaliation that exists within the farm worker and the Latino communities. Um, so one of the things that I was planning on mentioning, and I wasn't sure if it was okay for me to mention, was that during the hurricane, um, we already know Facebook is big. Everybody's on Facebook. My mother is on Facebook, you guys. Um, see what I'm saying? <laughs> no. Um, but the thing is that somebody snapped a picture of a truck that had ice ran on the side of it. So, you know, immigration enforcement, um, which played a pivotal role in the efforts that we were having to provide just because, again, it's a vulnerable population. I want to say that one of the families that we encountered was that, or one of the things that we encountered was that families and parents were scared to go out and leave their homes and go to the store because, you know, the fear that they might not be able to come back. So apart from, so we had the issue with the fear that existed, and we also had the issue with the fact that it was such a vulnerable community, so there was a lot of, of course, there was a lot of water, but a lot of the roads were damaged as far as, like, access to the nearest store became a bit of an issue. Um, Pink Hill has one food line, so the whole town went there, so, of course, eventually the food ran out. 
Um, so it literally came down to us having to create a plan, which was actually really interesting. The fact that we didn't already have a plan in place for situations like this, just because this isn't the first hurricane that North Carolina has experienced, but, um, it came to, you know, it was NC Fields collaborating with the local community health center with the Episcopal Farm Worker Ministry, um, along with the American education program. So with the school system in order to be able to come together and provide services, so water, you know, food, or the fact, you know, a lot of houses retain damage due to the water. Um, so us building that bridge is kind of like what NC Field does. Um, so there are resources out there, but the lack of information in the community, so doing a lot of outreach is going to play a pivotal role with the fall, with like the following hurricane because unfortunately, it's going to happen. But um, but we were having to collaborate and come together to create a plan, which was really good. But the thing is, the fact that there wasn't one in place made it a little hard just because you want to, if this organization asks for water, maybe this organization can ask for clothing, maybe this organization can ask for another resource that would be needed for the community. So we were having to communicate through Facebook, guys. I promise I'm not promoting Facebook, but... Um, <laughs> But that's what we were having to do in order to be able to make this happen. But the thing is, for people that the roads were messed up all around and didn't have, wow, time flies. Um, so the people that didn't have access to, like, the roads were all, you know, were all down. There were, there was an organization that did have access to a helicopter, so we could still help provide food to these families. Um, I spaced out. I was on a roll, too. Um, <laughs> we'll do that to you. <laughs> um, so I want to say that one of the other things that we have to keep in mind whenever it comes to the farm worker and the Latino community is the fact that a lot of the Latino population works in agriculture. So like you had mentioned earlier, the fact that the hurricane is already gone, we're still seeing the effects of the hurricane. Um, being the fact that they do work in agriculture and a lot of damage to the crops, that means there's no work for these families. Whenever there's no work, there's no money. If there's no money, you know, food becomes an issue, other things become an issue, clothing becomes an issue, and then with the winter coming along, we have to keep all that in mind in order to be able to provide the resources that the community needs. So as far as like building resilience, it really is gonna take the community coming together in order to be able to survive, to be honest. And um, I just wanted to come and bring that to the table, things to keep in mind whenever it comes to the Hispanic population and the language barrier that obviously exists within these populations. But that's all I came to say for today. Thank you. We're also going to hopefully have about 30 minutes for Q&A, and we're going to hear more from her because I have some questions. Um, Marion, next. Okay, so there's been some confusion around my name, so I thought I would just say it. It's Marion Engelman Lotto. Um, there are all kinds of variations, and I answer to anything. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here on this fantastic uh, panel. And I'm hoping to say a few words about two things. One is um, Esther Calhoun and I are going to tag team on Uniontown. Um, Uniontown is a community that received 4 million tons of coal ash in the wake of a coal ash disaster in Kingston, Tennessee. And, um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. And then I want to direct to the students in the room a few lessons learned about providing technical assistance and legal representation in the context of disasters. <laughs> so first at Earth Justice and, and then at Yale, where I am now, we have the honor of representing Esther Calhoun and other residents of Uniontown who filed a complaint in 2013 against the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, or ADEM, alleging that ADEM, the state environmental agency, violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination by recipients of federal funds on the basis of race, color, or national origin and violated EPA regulations by reissuing a landfill permit authorizing the operation of Arrowhead Landfill without adequate protections for health and what the welfare of the community. Uniontown has a population just under 2,000 people and is approximately 90% African American. The per capita income is under, sorry to do stats, but under $10,000. Uniontown has multiple sources of pollution. How many people here uh, watch um, Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. Okay, you know that shtick he does about, we don't have time for that. Well, this is one of those pieces. So Uniontown has a cheese plant, cheese spray fields that emit terrible odors, a catfish plant 
and Arrowhead, the largest landfill in the state, with now a, a mountain of coal ash in it. Um, there are very few businesses in town, and because the wastewater treatment center, so it's not a center, it's a system, and it's so antiquated and dysfunctional, the town doesn't have the capacity to attract industry. Sewage from the town goes into an open cesspool and spray fields, much like what we saw on the tour yesterday, but for human waste. As, the, um, as at this spray field, broken sprayers shoot liquid fecal matter continuously into the air. So you can watch just spray, spray, and pooling into the air without stop, and liquids, uh, liquid from this, this fecal matter from the sprayers go into a nearby creek and travel into the Alabama River. There's been a Clean Water Act enforcement action about this in the courts for years. But Uniontown has no money, and Adam hasn't given any money either to do anything about this discharge. But as The Daily Show's Trevor Noah says, we don't have time for that. On December 22, 2008, 1.1 billion gallons of coal ash from a power plant at the Tennessee Valley Authority's Kingston Fossil Plant in, in no, that is not the end of my time. <laughs> Time. <laughs> <laughs> so this, <laughs> this billion gallons of coal ash from a power plant at a TVA uh, fossil plant in um, fossil fuel plant in Tennessee broke through an impoundment and an 84 acre containment area. This was the largest coal ash disaster in U.S. history at the time, and the coal ash swept through homes. As those of you who lived through the spill into the Dan River know. So, uh, coal ash is a toxic byproduct of coal fire power plants, which contains heavy metals such as arsenic, lead, selenium, and other cancer-causing agents. The predominantly white Kingston area was declared a Superfund site, and the Tennessee Valley Authority and EPA, in their wisdom, felt pressure to clean up the site and move out the coal ash. Okay. Well, the next year, in 2009, the EPA approved a proposal, again, this is the wisdom, to ship four million tons of coal ash from Kingston to Arrowhead. Arrowhead is allowed already to take waste from 33 states. That's where we're sitting. That's the entire eastern seaboard. And the permit also has a provision to allow it to take special waste. And under the solid waste law, coal ash is considered not hazardous waste, but special waste. It's very special. It causes cancer. Maybe that makes it special. Edom also allows the landfill to operate right next to a historic black cemetery, New Hope Church Cemetery. And now to add insult to injury, the landfill accepts 4 million tons of coal ash. And by the way, this landfill is still advertising to power plants, ship your coal ash to, our, uh, to Arrowhead. Over and over, Esther Calhoun and others in the community asked why coal ash with its carcinogens, its neurotoxins, its poisons, with arsenic, boron, cadmium, hexavalent chromium, lead, mercury, selenium. Why was this coal ash considered hazardous for purposes of the cleanup in the predominantly middle-class white community in Kingston, Tennessee, but not when it came off the train? Not when it came off the train in 90% African-American Uniontown. More than 93% of the population in Kingston, by the way, is white, and the per capita income is about three times that of Uniontown. Then there's the basic question. Why was coal ash from ten the Tennessee disaster moved across state lines more than 300 miles away to go to Uniontown and piled directly across from that county road where people live in their homes? And once that decision was made, why didn't dis uh, officials in the public and private sector, the county, ADEM, the landfill, take steps to ensure the strongest possible protections were in place, including strongest standards for liners, the leachate system, leachate disposal, monitoring, public information, fugitive dust control, and on and on. Groundwater protection standards, analysis of corrective measures, for example. Why weren't such measures put into place to ensure that the health and welfare of the community is protected? Arrowhead sits just across the county road from the longtime homes of Uniontown residents who are on fixed incomes. Access to health care is different. There's no difficult. There's no hospital in Uniontown. And residents travel long distances for specialized care. Since the coal ash arrived, residents have experienced respiratory problems, neuropathy, nosebleeds, headaches, dizziness, skin conditions, nausea, interference with sleep, interference with outdoor activities among... I'm getting you depressed. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> with, 
these uh, failures as background, residents of Uniontown filed a discrimination complaint alleging that ADEM violated Title VI in the issuance of the permit without adequate protections, um, having a clear disparate impact on the basis of race. And the complaint lists some of these harms. <coughs> um, Esther will talk about the land being hard earned, the rural way of life, um, and so I'll, I'll skip some of this and, and the cemetery, a sacred space which is um, being desecrated by the landfill. On yesterday's bus trip, Ruth Santiago asked how we reached the settlement in North Carolina um, on the North Carolina complaint under Title VI when EPA has been so poor at enforcing the law and Uniontown exemplifies her question. We filed reams of support for the complaint, photographs, declarations. EPA did a site visit and smelled the landfill, heard about people's hardship. And yet, last year, after all that, EPA closed the case, saying there was insufficient evidence that the landfill's permit caused the problems. EPA said its investigation raised concerns about ADEM's civil rights compliance, but would continue talking to ADEM separately. The end, case closed. But it's not the end. The key takeaway here is not what EPA did, though it was unfounded and we're figuring out whether we can sue them or bring other challenges. We're going to keep pushing to make civil rights enforcement a reality in the environmental justice context. But the key takeaway is the resilience of the people in Uniontown. They are continuing to fight. In addition to other lawsuits, Benjamin Eaton, the vice president of Black Belt Citizens, this is Madam President, Benjamin Eaton ran for county commissioner and won. And he's now in a position to make decisions about future siting efforts. Last night, Omega Wilson talked about community-based participatory research. And our team at Yale and Sokobi Wilson at University of Maryland are working on black, uh, with Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice, the organization in Uniontown, to document the impacts of the landfill. And I have the good fortune of seeing Esther again on Tuesday when we start a 10-day trip to launch a major comprehensive community-based participatory research project. Esther, and, and I need to give a shout out to Lucretia Christian, who's here as well, and the other board members of uh, Black Belt Citizens are in there fighting every day. Finally, just a couple of words to the students about our role. What will be your role as lawyers, public health officials, researchers, policy analysts, if we take seriously the principle of lawyers and technical assistance providers on tap but not on top? In the context of recovery and resistance, what is the role of the technical assistance provider in providing support to communities of color and low-income communities most affected? A couple of quick points. First, you're the conduit to other resources. During 9-11 in New York, for example, people came to us from Chinatown and other low-income communities, saying they had concerns about how cleanup funds were used, saying that they were exposed, a whole range of issues, and we were able to tap the resources of the private sector you don't have to do it on your, on, uh, all yourself. You can tap other resources and you are part of networks that you need to make available. Second, keep in mind people with disabilities. I was also at New York Lawyers during Katrina and, and they, when New York Lawyers has a big disability program. It opened my eyes to the isolation of people with disabilities in disasters. There are people in wheelchairs trapped upstairs in, in high rises, people with no batteries for ventilators, people whose aides can't get to them, who aren't allowed into shelters. We, as individuals and legal assistance providers, have to organize ourselves to reach out and help. Access to information, this is third and almost last, is critical. In times of crisis, people don't know what they're being exposed to. And that adds insult to injury because people get fearful. After the BP disaster in the Gulf, I had the good fortune of being able to go and work with people but they were concerned about the use of chemical dispersants, which are used to break up the oil in an oil spill. We litigated information requests and were able to make information about these chemicals available online. Even work on access to information can be helpful. And finally, part of your job is to be geeky. Enjoy it. Delve into the details and be involved in anticipating problems to prevent them. My last example is right here in North Carolina. The state general permit for swine CAFOs, which we talked about yesterday, has a requirement that lagoons, or these cesspools, are big enough to withstand what is supposed to be an unusual event, a storm that is, only happens every 25 years. But the definition in the fine print at the back of the permit 
measured that storm according to a 1962 technical bulletin. Well, I'll tell you, storms that came every 25 years in 1962 come every year now. And so it may be geeky, but you need to look in what are those definitions. And as technical assistance providers, it's your job to dive into the details, work with communities to get the word out and prevent problems. In short, there are so many ways that you can get involved. Direct service, planning, negotiation, geeking out, all are in partnership and in service to communities fighting for their own future. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Esther Calhoun. I'm the president of Black Belt Citizens Fight for Health and Justice. Can y'all hear her? I was born in Uniontown. <laughs> okay, I'll get wrapped in I was born in Uniontown. Um, when I was about 17, I moved to Indiana. I stayed there like 13 years. I came back home. My grandfather, in, you know, still living in Uniontown, found that Uniontown was just, just going away, just like all this environmental injustice. But to really talk about my impact is like, we got to bring to the table racism. We got to talk about racism. Okay, we are graduates or whatever, you know, like we're going to be lawyers, we're going to be environmental, you know, different things. But the thing is, am I going to be the solution or am I going to be the problem? Can I deal with different people? You know, the rich people, you know, like the rich get all the care, but the impact in Uniontown, we're not getting it. You know, have a decent lawyer, we're not getting it. We get the impact, you know, like we get the things that other people don't want, especially the black and the poor, the brown. We don't talk about racism. EPA don't even talk about, do they really know what racism is? Do they even know what environmental racism is? Let me explain from my point of view. Having your own property in Uniontown is the greatest thing. And living in rural areas is the greatest thing. But having it and have these environmental people, the, the landfill, which I believe the landfill, the cheese plant, all these things that she spoke about, coming to your area and try to run you out of your, your community. Now, that's racism. How can we fight back with education? You know, with not having the proper lawyers, environmental people. This is where we start, young people. We start right here. You know, like, we don't need to go to get Trump. I know, you know, he's not my favorite person. But guess what? We need to start here, changing within our heart, and looking into those communities like Esther Calhoun community, like the people's on the panel community, those ones that get dumped. It ain't just started. We have been targeted for many years. If ADM do their job, which is our uh, state government, if, and uh, EPA do their job, we wouldn't have these problems. Everybody do their job. Step out their comfort zone and stay focused. But what I've been through, I don't think neither one of y'all could wear my shoes. Intimidation. $30 million lawsuit in a poor old town with just like 2,000 people. You know, like, no jobs. We still have separate schools. But we are human beings. Come on, y'all. We're just different colors, but we still got the same blood. We got to change the world. You know, I came to tell you, it ain't easy. The, the Arrowhead landfill went over my ancestors' grave. This is what I seen with my eyes. $30 million, he sued me because I wouldn't shut up. I'm never going to shut up because we got too much out there that we need to be fighting for. <laughs> and we got to continue to fight. But in Union time, we have so many environmental injustice things like the cheese plant. Smells like a hog, hog farm. Can't deal with the flies. You can't sit outside. You got, you got to stay in the house. That's another form of slave. You know, I, I want my freedom. Okay, the, the, the lagoon. They say don't say outhouse, Esther. But how many of y'all know what an outhouse is? Okay. Well, I, I grew up on the 300 acre of a, a sharecropper with my parents. And we had the outhouse. And we had the wallpaper was the newspaper. So I came from the poor area. But where I live at now, it's so impacted with so much injustice. But then, guess what? I heard the new word of a chocolate, a chocolate city. Do y'all know what chocolate city is? It used to be D.C. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, a, it's, it's like our community is run by black, the brown color, city council, no voice. 
You know, you go to city council, you're supposed to have a voice. You want to know my impact. I'm just telling you. I just be real because if I don't tell you my story from my heart, then you wouldn't get it. I tell you to come to Uniontown. Come stay with me like the, uh, the fellow did. Robert came from New York and Mexican, stayed in my house for two months. I walked in the house. He said, uh, I walked in the house and he was sitting at the table. I knew he was cutting onions, but the onions wasn't his problem. He was crying. He said, I never thought to have a, pri a, privilege, a privilege not to drink water. I got arsenic in my water. We got all these problems going on, but we got all these people graduating, but where they going? They ain't going to the most impacted area like Uniontown or like South Carolina, North Carolina. It's all over the South <coughs> where there's racism. When are we going to pull it together? My impact on my life, I got neuropathy. I look at people's every day. People come knocking at my door every day. Like, Esther, uh, how can you help with this? Uh, suicide. No, I know about suicide because my son was one of them. But he didn't complete it. God helped me and he kept me going on. You know, like, just going through all these different things with cancer, kidney problems, no decent doctors. I mean, you got to go 80 miles, but no jobs. We don't even have a grocery store. But guess what? My brown peoples are leading the thing. You know, like the, the mayor's brown, you know, like black. Okay, we'll say black. And the city council are black. But you don't have a voice into what coming into your city. Yes, yeah, Senator Booker, he came down. He saw it. I give a shout out to him because guess what? He walked all around the place and he saw how devastating to see. Like she was talking about the sprinklers, sprinkling, short, uh, shooting the uh, sewage on the ground. Where did they do that at? Why can't we have a state of the art uh, treatment plant? Oh, they got the almost a million or more dollars <coughs> to get a sewage uh, pipe to Demopolis, like 30 miles. But is that for the resident or this for the the the, the, the industries? I think it's for the industries. It's nothing about the community. And we're the community, the one that need it. Why are they so important Then we're not? Because we could use the treatment plant, treat the water and go to the sewer, but they're going to get the money. Well, who? The people that got money. The, who, the people that is, is really impacting our community. Because guess what? I feel that the, the, the leech ain't going right into the, the get treated right there. Why can't they have their own? It's never about us. It's never about the poor people. That's why we need you environmental lawyer. That's why we need Marilyn. You know, like, she's my friend. She's the first one that got me out there. But we need people that want to change the world. Until we bring racism to the table, we're going to continue to have cancer. Until you educate your children to not think about that. that she's a different color for me. No, teach your kids to play with us. That's what's impacting us because we'll go to school, we'll graduate, but we never graduate about racism. We never graduate about discrimination. Help us tell EPA, look, you're not going to do your job, get out the way. Hey, right. damn, you're not going to do your job, get out the way because people are hurting. But uh, with me having neuropathy and a lot of other people's having neuropathy, like in June of this last year, when the fellow was down, I stopped walking. I stopped walking for seven days. And being in pack, like we are in these communities, it's not right, y'all. Just not right to not walk for seven days, to not know what's going on with, but coal ash is not hazardous. But all these chemicals, nothing wrong with them. That's, that stuff is not right. It hurts me because, you know what, if I, had, if I could be a lawyer or if I could change a lot of things, I would change the way we feel about each other. Because until we change that, until we acknowledge we're no different and your problem is my problem, stepping out your comfort zone, I tell people, stop up, step out your comfort zone. Stay focused. If you're comfortable, you ain't doing nothing. Once you start being uncomfortable, I love being uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable sitting up here because guess what? I know my grandma isn't prop 
isn't like everybody else gram grammar. But guess what? I'm speaking from the heart. And that's what y'all need to hear. happy to be here sharing this space with all of you and this learning exchange that we're having. And so on my way here from Puerto Rico, I, uh, I was reading a book. I'm still reading through it. Um, it's called A Paradise Built in Hell. And the subtitle is uh, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster, right? And so the title of this panel, EJ and Disaster Response. So most of you, uh, the author, by the way, is Rebecca Solnit. I highly recommend the book from what I've seen so far. Um, so most of you know, well, I think everyone here knows that in September 2017, Puerto Rico was hit by two hurricanes, uh, category four, five, mostly five, that knocked out all of the electric power on the island. And you probably know that Puerto Rico is a very densely populated island. And I, I think most people here know that Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Um, You'd be surprised how many people do not know that we are on the map, actually. We often do not appear on the map. Um, but anyway, so it, the hurricanes um, knocked out all the power, the electric power, and with it, um, a good part of the potable water supply, right? Because a lot of the water um, gets pumped with electric pumps. And so that got affected. Wastewater treatment was impacted. Um, uh, telecommunications. Um, these big companies, these big corporations were not investing in the proper infrastructure to provide service, but charging really hefty rates in Puerto Rico. Um, so about, the estimates I guess are about 200,000 homes were damaged, uh, roofs um, blown away and things like that. And the net exodus, like right after the hurricane, obviously lots of people left because, well, again, I need to clarify, Puerto Ricans, we are citizens of the United States. We were, um, I guess you could say, granted citizenship in 1917, um, right in time for the First World War. And um, so Puerto Ricans, obviously, we, we fought, um, or our family members have um, been involved in those wars, and uh, many US wars. So anyway, so um, about 140,000 um, people left and um, never came back. Many more than that left, but many came back, right, after the hurricanes. The estimate, as you all know, and, and Mustafa showed a slide, that um, there was, uh, you know, imagine, we had no power, we had no telecommunications, no one knew how many people were dying. And so when President Trump went to Puerto Rico, he said, you know, someone told him it was about 16 people who had died. Um, but as it turns out, studies have confirmed, although, of course, the president does not admit it, that um, about 3,000 people died as a result of the passing, especially of Hurricane Maria. And, um, you know, roads were affected, the whole bit. Um, and so what happened, uh, actually, was that this was a so-called natural disaster, but Puerto Rico, there was um, a long-standing unnatural disaster that's been going on in Puerto Rico for a very long time. And it has to do with our, with lots of things, right? But um, I guess more recently, um, the economic model, the collapse of the economic model in Puerto Rico. Uh, and a, a model based on basically um, massive tax exemptions that makes the government have no funds to provide any services. I mean, talking about underserved communities, um, you know, we could talk about the schools, the health system, et cetera, et cetera that are really lacking. And so this Operation Bootstrap um, created these huge tax exem exemptions so that um, industries could come in, ever more contaminating industries as the decades went by, starting in the late 40s, 50s, 60s. And so, for example, um, we had this petrochemical uh, phase, which impacted 
um, us in, I'm in southeastern Puerto Rico actually, um, which is where we have the two um, most contaminating power plants on the island, um, the Aguirre Power Co Complex and the um, AES Coal Burning Power Plant. We've all worked on coal ash. Five minutes? Oh my God, I haven't even gotten to anything. <laughs> um, all right, so. Uh, so coal ash, major disaster in Puerto Rico, right? And after the, impacted by the hurricane, there's, of course, you know, coal ash contaminants in the groundwater in Puerto Rico. Um, and so basically, in terms, I want to talk a little bit about response. So I don't know how I do this. Go ahead, just talk. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's see. We have um, this in industrial complex. You know, for example, we have... Um, about 80% of the GMO agro industry has some part of its production in Puerto Rico, right? Most people know about Florida, but they, you know, they, fortunately, people in Florida have you know given them a hard time, and so they've all come to Puerto Rico, unfortunately. Um, and so, um, so we have a very, I, I guess you would argue, maybe a large part of the island is 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 an EJ area and um, sacrifice zones, right? Uh, especially southeastern Puerto Rico where we are. Um, and so what happened was that um, it, when the transmission lines from southern Puerto Rico with those big, where the big power plants are, that those transmission lines that um, transport energy to northern Puerto Rico where most of the population is, when they went down, people started doing for themselves because as we know, the government did not is not very present, not the federal government, not the Puerto Rico government either, not the you know, local government. Um, and I remember very clearly the night before the hurricane, um, watching the news and the governor was saying that there were ships waiting, as an island, right, that there were ships waiting to come in to help right after the passage of the hurricane. And I remember him mentioning specifically, the USS Comfort will be here, it's a hospital ship. It's going to be here as immediately after the hurricane passes. So. Um, you know, after the hurricane, that that didn't happen. But what did happen was, as um, Rebecca Solnit um, documents in her book, not not she didn't document Puerto Rico because she wrote it before, but um, how other communities have responded, right? Mutual aid, coming together and clearing the roads and feeding each other and looking for the medications and things like that. And so that definitely happened in, in Puerto Rico, right? We had that uh, mobilization and the re-discovery um, uh, of community that we've lost a lot of. And um, in, the, in the electric energy field, we, we are trying to um, promote a solution that changes our electric grid in a totally um, dramatic way from what we have now, central, big central station fossil fuel energy plants in the south transmitting to the north to um, what we call rooftop solar communities, right? And the reason why we do that is not just to have a technological fix. We do it to empower our communities, right? And we have um, online our sort of platform um, that is called queremosolpr.com, and it is a, a civil society um, a statement of what our energy grid should be, a, a mission and a vision and objectives, and it's a work in progress. It's not perfect, we're still working on it. We're getting a version three out soon with certain changes that we're making. Um, and we in, invite you to come you know, look at that and uh, that is, I think I'm just out of time. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, you know, basically it's our blue-green alliance. So the largest prep-up uh, union is part of this alliance. So what we know is, excuse me? Oh, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, right, which is the um, publicly captured private corporation that we have on the island that generates energy. Um, and although the government is talking about um, selling the generation units, the big power plants, we are totally against it because uh, investors or buyers of those plants will want to perpetuate their existence and continue generating based on fossil fuels. And so we would like to see, obviously, rooftop solar communities, um, demand response um, 
management programs, and energy efficiency programs, battery energy storage systems, et cetera, alternatives to this fossil fuel generation on an island that has so much potential. And I, I want to tell you that it, although the government, right after we released Queremos Sol, they adopted the one of the goals, our main goals is 100% um, renewable energy by 2050, 50% um, by 2035, um, but they're really just paying lip service. And in reality, <laughs> this is terrible, right? So what they want to do is make Puerto Rico the fracked gas uh, hub for the Caribbean, right. said in, the, in those right. words, right? So these are all LNG terminals, a three um, ship-based LNG terminals that would bring in methane gas from the U.S. and... Um, right, use it throughout Puerto Rico, and also a land-based terminal. And a whole lot of um, new combined cycle, fast ramping um, power plants that they allege that we need in order to integrate renewables. So it's, it's like the trickle down, right? It's like, oh, let's do, they're still talking about this natural, I don't like to call it natural, right? We gotta call it methane or fracked gas um, transition before we can actually go to renewables. We know that's not true. It, to a very large extent, it is not true. We already have um, 40, about 40%, 38 maybe, percent of our energy generation coming from methane gas. We can go directly to. But it's, it's um, but, it, but you know, that to do what we're proposing would basically turn the system on its head and emp empower communities like ours. So, you know, certainly we have really stiff opposition, although it's very... Um, camouflaged by a lot of, as I said, lip service that, yeah, we want to do renewables. Yeah, I'll, I'll, down the line, we're going to do, we're going to do this. Um, so I wanted to say other things, but I just really feel bad about taking more time. And, and electric energy is a human right and, and energy, energy democracy, but of course we need energy literacy, right? So we, we would... Uh, we're, we're partnering with Sierra Club and other organizations on what is known as the Integrated Resource Plan in Puerto Rico to do the fight and get um, some measure of energy democracy for our island. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm pushing them so we can have at least 25 minutes of Q&A. So Leslie? Batting cleanup. Batting cleanup. I'm delighted to be batting cleanup. I'm really, really honored to be on this stellar all-women panel. I can't tell you. I'm just so honored, and I'm thrilled to be here, and I thank you so much for this invitation and um, to see old friends and new. And um, I just want to... I am very blessed. I get to work on environmental justice um, issues with the Sierra Club, for the Sierra Club, and many communities around the country. I am not here to speak for any community. I'm really here as an intermediary, and I'm very, very lucky. And, and um, I've worked with a lot of folks here in this room and people on this panel as well. And, and we just got back from San Juan. We had our board meeting in Puerto Rico. And we have 63 chapters, Some and our, our best chapter is our Puerto Rico chapter. I'm, I'm never like, oh, darn, I have to go to Puerto Rico. Uh, no, it is. It's, it's, it's really um, it's very inspiring. And so... But also, we have, um, I, I'm here to just um, be the intermediary and talk about a place that is very close to my heart, which is Texas, where I lived for a while. And I wanted to bring, lift up the issues that happened in East Texas, in the Gulf Coast of Texas, after, te after Harvey. Um, and because uh, Harvey was such an incredible weather event, but also, um, and uh, Mustafa did a great job about um, illuminate, illuminating the Houston Ship Channel issues, it was also it also became another man-made disaster um, due to the heavy industrial facilities along the Houston Ship Channel. Um, the numbers of petrochemical chemical plants, um, refineries, um, dioxin Superfund sites, and um, shipping the rail and barge and People live right in there. The community of Manchester, the, I mean, there are people who live in their houses in right next to tanks. There are toys in front of the houses right next to these storage tanks. There's a fertilizer plant right next to storage tanks. And talk about if there was ever, God forbid, some kind of, you know, um, attack, um, that it just would be 
a um, conflagration for those communities. And I also want to lift up, in that whole Texas Gulf Coast, it was also Port Arthur, Texas, the home of some very good friends of ours, um, and then also going down Rockport, Corpus Christi. And so I'm going to read it. I have to read a little bit because I can't remember all these numbers myself. But I just wanted to give the volume of um, the thing about Hurricane Harvey was that it was a rain event that stalled right in the Gulf. I don't have pictures, but basically 60 inches of rain stalled right above from Port Arthur to the Louisiana West Coast, west side of Louisiana, all the way down to Corpus Christi, which is a huge area. And Houston alone is 655 square miles. Houston is larger than New York City, Washington, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and Miami. That's how big Houston is. So this is just one section. And Harvey hit on August 25th, dumping 40 inches of rain in the Houston area and 60 inches of rain in Port Arthur. And um, it dumped about 19 trillion gallons of, of rainwater. 270,000 homes were impacted, um, 80,000 homes with at least 18 inches of rainwater. It created 200 million cubic yards of debris, enough to fill up about a football stadium 125 times. And the wastewater, 13, 1,300, 1,300 wastewater facilities were inundated, 13 Superfund sites with toxic materials were flooded. Um, and um, basically, it was about $125 billion in damage, second only to uh, Maria and then Katrina. And it really was 8.3 million pounds of unpermitted air pollution was released. And a more than 150 million gallons of contaminated wastewater and sewage water was released. Uh, Governor Abbott declared a state of disaster on August 23rd, but many of the facilities did not close, did not shut down until three or four days later. So there was unpermitted air that was constantly still being permitted. Because the facilities were still running, there were explosions. The Arkema plant, which was a chemical plant in Crosby, you might have heard about, and the total petrochemical refinery plant in Port Arthur had outages and explosions. And just from the Arkema plant, 255,598 pounds of air pollution was released. That's reported. Our um, colleagues with um, Tejas, the Texas Environmental Justice Advisory Services, the Parises, Juan and Ana Paris, and then our organizer, um, Juan's son, Brian, who many of you may know. Brian was out there doing, we got Brian a, a, a um, what do you call those things? A drone. So I was sending Brian a camera, you know, we're trying to get Brian the equipment he needs. So he has drone footage of the Arkema plant, one of the first pictures of that that the Intercept used. Um, and then, so all these industrial discharges really are unreported. And then there were a series of high ozone days. Um, but I also want to mention in Houston, I also want to mention, I went to Port Arthur about for about a month after um, Harvey, as soon as we could get there, and I drove um, Hilton Kelly, who many of you know, he won the Goldman Prize in 2014. His uh, nephew drove, was driving me around so I could take pictures, and I leaned out. We were driving through the Motiva parking lot, which was still flooded after a month. That's the largest refinery in North America. We were driving through the, the and I'm leaning out the window, and I got splashed by the water. I have, still have a chemical burn and a scarf just from getting splashed. So that water was so toxic and caustic. And when I, I just see, when you see pic people of weight, pictures of people fleeing the water, wading through the water, to remember that water is full of sewage, full of chemicals, and nothing, no human living thing should be exposed to it. So now it's all in the sediment. So the communities, just like have been everywhere else, really did so much mutual aid um, and came to to help each other because they're, the government really didn't. And the disaster relief funds, the CDBG grant funds, are still being held up. Um, you know, Ms. Pembroke talked about how their funds were stalled and then sent to Texas. Well, the CDBG funds from HUD in Texas go to the general land office. The person who is the commissioner of the general land office is George P. Bush. Mm. George P. Bush is the son of Jeb, nephew of W, grandson of HW. He's being groomed for better things. Um, so that money is still, they still have not dispersed that money to those communities that need it most. 
And as you might have read just recently, the money that's supposed to be going to, for general disaster relief, for all these communities that we're talking about, was almost was held hostage for the border wall funding. Mm -hmm. All right, and so due to immense community pressure from many of you all I know and others, that, that money is not going to be used yet for the border wall. But that is still a problem. That money, if it's not, doesn't get designated, does not get to the state, it still can be used for other things. And it's a real, we still have to lift our voices up to make sure that it doesn't happen. But the money is still, there are so many houses, there's so many people, and just like, I mean, Marion actually stole a lot of what I was gonna say, but that's okay. Uh, good, because you have less than a minute. Okay, good. So, but I wanted to say also, um, a year after Harvey, um, the, so many great, um, as I mentioned, there was so much mutual aid, so many coalitions, NAACP, um, the Home Coalition. I know the NAACP, Denise Blackbird Ahmed, Abdul Rahman is here from Indiana. I see you, Denise. And um, she, you really should talk, to, all you students should talk to her about what the NAACP has been doing in terms of disaster adaptation and mitigation. And then there was the Home Coalition and also Another Gulf is Possible. The people came over from Louisiana and supported people in Texas, you know, to provide advice and provide mutual aid. So there was a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal a year after um, Harvey. Is that for me? I said that for a minute. All right. There was a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not ignoring you, Vernice. Um, there's a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal a year after the hurricane. And there was, it, was, it was held at Texas Southern University, um, hosted by Dr. Robert Bullard, who you've heard about, and you know, you know who that is. And we had buckets around housing, transportation, labor, the labor issues around the workers who were coming in and being exploited, um, this is disability, the communities who were disabled, and also the immigration issues that have also been um, mentioned, um, how ICE was coming through. Um, Hilton told us about how the Cajun Navy came in and was intimidating people. I mean, these guys, these, you know, these guys are coming in from western Louisiana in their boats, holstered guns, and try, you know, getting very upset that they had to pick up black people, too. And that was, it got very ugly and very scary for some people. And so there are a lot of, ish, a lot of things happen. Women um, are also very vulnerable. Um, older people are very vulnerable when you have these terrible, terrible, um, disasters. There's vulnerable communities. Children are vulnerable. Children get separated from their parents. And so the mutual aid that happens because the government wasn't there was incredible. We have that all documented from the Harvey Human Rights Tribunal. Human Rights Tribunals are a very good way of getting this information up. They've done it in Buckingham with the um, Atlanta Coast Pipeline. I want to just say one quick thing that I think students really should be aware of that's happening is that the, along with just these issues, you really have to watch the fact that local control is being eroded, mm -hmm. all right? And that even if a local community wants to ban fracking, they are being um, denied that right in their legislatures. And I know this is happening in North Carolina. It's definitely happening in Texas. So the issue of local control, local ordinances being uh, superseded by state law is a real problem, especially in this um, disaster realm, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm urging your law students and other students to pay attention to this big issue. It's not talked about a lot, but it affects everything in terms of local control, and I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So we have 23 minutes for questions. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of this extraordinary panel and their expertise to ask away. Um, right? And Dr. Johnson? Oh, we got to share some mics, don't we? So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I just want to direct this directly um, to Leslie, but also the member, other members of the panel that uh, it was reported this week in LA Times that the Texas DEQ uh, told NASA uh, through Trump EPA not to fly the plane to do pollution detection over, uh, over the, uh, the disaster zone. So we see a pattern here of covering up science uh, and also trying to cover up uh, disaster response related science. I wanted you to um, talk a little bit about that and how that interrelates to this environmental justice problem. Thank oh, you. Thanks. That's a good question. Yeah, we just heard about that too. Um, Brian sent a, Brian called us and said that that was happening. So basically, NASA was going to fly a plane to look at the pollution 
and the and Texas, you know, um, I don't know if they're going to shoot the plane down or what, but there was. Um, they did not let that plane go off. They had it says all the technical equipment. They have these planes that can mon. You know, there was no all the air monitors. I forgot to say all the air monitors. The few that there were there were shut down. So here we have hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of pounds of air pollution being released because the facilities weren't shut down. They're supposed to shut them down. And in terms of disaster planning in the state of, I mean, Texas has the highest number of air pollution. Texas and Louisiana, you know, trade off back and forth. So it was very little difference. So yeah, that plane was not allowed to fly. Um, we're, we are looking at that issue with um, our chapter there and trying to figure out what we're going to do, you know, what can we could say about it. But yeah, we did hear about that. And it's just another way of denying communities and science, you know, this information. If you don't have the information, then you can't, you know, figure out a remedy. And we really need it because there's going to be other storms. And we know this. And that area, the, the Gulf, that area, that industrial Gulf area, including from Pascagoula, Mobile, all the way down. Corpus Christi, like I said, they, they shut down the refinery, so it wasn't so bad. And Corpus is very flat, and there's, there, the community is trapped there between the highway and the refineries and the port. So all those port communities are getting more and more inundated with emissions because the Panama Canal has been widened, so you have these supermax ships coming through. So the rail and the, the containers are, are, and they're also slamming and hurting those communities that are in those areas. So um, we're going to stay on top, we're going to try to stay on top of that situation. Dr. Johnson, and there's a question over here. And this is for any of the panel, and it just occurred to me in thinking about disaster um, relief and how it is, um, differently given to communities. Can you all talk a little bit about or any experiences you might have had with those buyout processes and the despair, the injustice between um, communities of color, low wealth communities and wealthy communities where wealthy communities end up being richer at the end of a disaster episode and the poor communities poor? So there's a big land grab in Puerto Rico going on, especially for coastal areas, beachfront property. And um, so uh, actually groups that are working on uh, legal aid related to disaster relief are anticipating that scores of local communities will be displaced from areas that are said to be too flood prone and then um, you know, the, the land will be um, sold to especially, um, you know, uh, stateside and, and, and foreign um, uh, residents. And also, um, this, another um, thing that is happening is that, um, you know, this disaster relief thing is like a big business, and this is not my area or anything, but I did see a, a report by what is called the Center for the New Economy in Puerto Rico, not the most progressive thing in the world, right? But they're saying that 90% of the relief funds so far that, that have reached Puerto Rico, not much of it has, but um, most of those funds are going to stateside companies, and they're hiring people at minimum wage to do, do really shoddy work on home repairs. Um, and so, you know, the economics of this does, don't work either. So there, there's a big study. Um, I'm trying to find it on, um, on Twitter. Well, I, I, I posted it on Twitter, on Twitter yesterday. But a big study in the New York Times, the LA Times, and I think the Houston Chronicle that appeared on Thursday about the differential between how much money, particularly they were talking about Harvey, how much money is going to more affluent communities in terms of disaster recovery funds and how little is going to the communities that were hardest hit. And that, that is exacerbating the um, wealth inequality and the differential in, in the wealth base. So people who had homes no longer have homes, but they also can't get back the same mm -hmm. level of restitution from the federal government. And that's going to be particularly true in Puerto Rico, right, where it's not just differential, but there's animus in how those disaster funds are coming forward. Next question. Hi. Um, thanks so much for this panel. My name is Danielle Purifoy. I'm um, at UNC Chapel Hill in the geography department. 
Um, I have two questions, if I may. Um, so the first is about um, Alabama. So I've done um, some work on um, the wastewater sanitation funding, um, financing um, in the Black Belt, particularly Lowndes County. So I know Catherine Coleman Flowers and Acre and have heard a lot about Uniontown. Um, I, and I know particularly about um, the issue with Uniontown and its wastewater treatment plants and some of the financing challenges around that. I was wondering if y'all could speak a little bit more to that because I think it's important for this audience to kind of understand what happened there. Um, and maybe some of the barriers you've had with financing or kind of trying to transform the um, wastewater sewage uh, treatment there. And then, um, and then I had a, a question for Ms. Santiago. I mean, you mentioned um, just really, um, just really quickly, you had mentioned the land grabs that are going on. And I had been reading about how those were tied to um, heirs' property um, challenges there. And I was wondering, again, for this audience and you know, just understanding a little bit more about the nuances um, of like why those land grabs are um, perhaps even easier, right, uh, um, in Puerto Rico um, with, the, with the heirs' property issues. Thank you. Okay, like starting off with the, uh, the sewage is like, uh, Uniontown had gotten the $4.8 million from Senator Sewer and uh, Congress late Sewer, I'm sorry, and um, we, from my, you know, understanding that the money was wasted because of the soil testing and it didn't perk and all these different things. But at the same time, you got to look at the catfish pond, you know, the catfish plant used more water than the, all the residents in the whole community. And that's the waste of what you're getting that funding for is not for the community, it's for, it's for these industries. And uh, having that, done and now they didn't follow the money so corruption corruption plays in a lot of these areas the money is there we got the same engineer they want to continue to use the same engineer with this other money we're getting so it's not going to get fixed until we start it's not it's not like we're not trying to correct our elected officials but you can't do that when you got voter fraud and what are we going to do about once you get this evidence and just like we need these lawyers, like once you get this evidence, how can it be, you know, put in the, the right place that these people can be held accountable? So that's where we at now. And I'll let her get to that legal part because I'm not, I'm just a. We're the tag team. <laughs> so um, just take a step back. So um, there are so many problems with integrated sewage systems or lack thereof in Alabama um, that, you know, just scratch the surface even in Uniontown. But um, about 15, 20 years ago, people were going to file a Clean Water Act suit because of this antiquated system, even back then. And it was already leaking into the Alabama River, clearly violating the Clean Water Act. And ADEM, uh, it, you, when you bring a Clean Water Act suit, you have to give 60 days notice so that the state knows and can come in and bring an enforcement action. They brought an enforcement action, then they just sat on it for decades, you know, for really just sat on it. And so for many, many years, this problem was just festering and there's, you know, the, the system was a non-system. And um, so Terry Sewell L, uh, helped to get USDA funds and that's the $4.8 million. But, um, and some of it went for a new pump and some things, but a big chunk of it went to this engineering firm that decided to build not a modern system, but a second spray field. And the second spray field was useless. And it was really Esther and Ben Eaton who dogged it who just went out there and looked at the spray field and ultimately they found, though the spray field was certified, um, that they had, they, first of all, they had taken the, the, the feces from the first spray field and built the berm around the second spray field with feces. And then they built a hole in the feces to, uh, because they knew that the, the stuff would percolate up to release it underneath the berm once it started operating. And that was found, they couldn't certify it and open it. So they wasted the money and, uh, and the town was left with this horrible situation. And so there's issues of corruption that are raised, there's issues of the antiquated system, and now, as Esther was saying before, there's this initiative that somehow ADEM has come up with a rainy day fund in another community we're working in, in Tallahassee, where they're there's a suit and there's pressure from the landfill and the town to somehow modernize that facility. But for all these 15, 20 years, they've never used their rainy day fund to improve the Uniontown 
uh, system, but the landfill um, has decided, I guess, that they now want to modernize the system and put their leachate through the system. So now Terry Sewell is coming up with a whole new approach and new money with the same darn engineer and the same problems. And so it's really, uh, there needs to be community empowerment, there needs to be transparency, there needs to be modernization, and it's so great, Danielle, that you are working on this issue and uh, bringing some light to it, and I hope other people will too. Okay, um, land grabs in Puerto Rico are historical things, right? So um, the big hotels, the resorts, have always grabbed, especially beach, beachfront areas. Um, land grabs were also historical in the sense of sugarcane monoculture, right? Um, all kinds of things happened to, to dispossess people of the land um, when sugarcane uh, was was uh, brought in at, on a, at, on that level, right? On a, that pervasive level. Um, and but what happened in terms of heirs' property? Yes, um, we do have a civil code in Puerto Rico that requires uh, it, that or creates a regime of forced heirs, right? So, um, with very few exceptions. Uh, t uh, people cannot disinherit their heirs. So even if they die intestate or, or they make a will, they will have to include all heirs. And so that makes it difficult, especially because of the um, migration patterns that we've had as Puerto Ricans, right? Um, so, you know, my parents migrated to the States. I was born in the South Bronx, but they returned, and, but many do not return. And so now we have a situation where about 5.8 million uh, Puerto Ricans live everywhere, but there are certain clusters, right? But there are some in Alaska and wherever. And, um, and so they don't come back. And so this, in, this succession issue, these heirs, um, oftentimes uh, don't, don't resolve property issues. Um, and, and then land lays fallow and abandoned and, you know, uh, yeah, that, that, that could be um, prime um, property for, for a land grab. Um, the other thing that happened a lot in Puerto Rico was related to this agricultural practices, right, where people were um, brought in to work in the fields, um, in mostly for sugarcane, but also tobacco, um, and were, allowed to um, occupy lands, especially ecologically sensitive areas like wetlands that they were allowed to fill, but not given title. Just sort of this authorization that actually prevented acquiring title ever. Um, I won't go on into all the details, but um, so we have those situations where people can't even get um, federal assistance, FEMA assistance, because they don't have the kind of title that would be recognized um, for those purposes. But we, we, you know, there are groups that are very concerned about CDBG funds, especially being used to displace communities and pave the way for the land grabs. Can I just mention something? Um, so we are, this is another good project for you law students out there. So we are starting to hear, we're getting information or collecting information in Rich, South Richland County, South Carolina, not far from here. People are starting to get notices from the county that unless they elevate their homes, that um, they're not going to see any FEMA relief. And so a lot of this home, this housing stock is not is very poor. It's or trailers, and even if you could elevate it, it would fall apart. And even if you could elevate it, you couldn't afford it. So people are. It's also a way people are losing value of their land. They'll lose it by eminent domain, and they'll be losing their land. And we've seen that particularly you know, in the South Carolina coast for the resorts, and that's been a way to do that with flooding. I think Ms. Pembroke also alluded to that. So that's another thing where local communities are really need, need help in and assistance in terms of navigating this. And um, I like to just like, let's you know, follow the money, right? And so that's a way, um, but if the local government's in cahoots about this dispossession, then we have to um, go that way. But that is something that's going on. We're trying to get, and we're also hearing from other places like in Texas. So this is a national problem. Um, and folks that in South Carolina have, are dealing with post-hurricane um, Florence. So we have other questions. I just want to make a note. Um, there's a model going on here in North Carolina, a partnership between the North Carolina EJ 
um, Network and the Water Keepers Alliance, um, really trying to connect the issues around the Clean Water Act enforcement and water quality and how that's affected by disasters, but connecting that back to the communities that are also devastated by these floods. So instead of having two conversations going on, there's now one conversation going on in North Carolina, and it's a really extraordinary model. Well, so Vernice, you just read my, my mind. I was just, <laughs> I, I'm Elizabeth Haddix from the Julius Chambers Center for Civil Rights, and we partnered with Earth Justice and Marion um, on the Title VI uh, complaint here and Esther, I just wanted to say to you that, and we talked for just a second last night, but um, when you were speaking, I was remembering when Mary and, of course, we got the breaking news from, from our co-counsel about, about Uniontown. And during that period, it was, um, we were in the thick of it here on the Title VI complaint and on negotiating with DEQ and with EPA, and our, um, so I just wanted to share something with you about that. I remember thinking when we, when we heard about Uniontown um, that we should all just go to DC and shut EPA down and put our bodies on the ground and not let them out and hold them hostage. Um, and, it, you know, I thought about how critical that would have been. I, I, you know, I was also thinking about um, you know, how when EPA ignored all of the science that Marion and Earth, you know, that the, all of the good lawyers and scientists and interns put together and sent up to DC with that complaint that we filed around the same time your complaint was filed, um, it got ignored for so long. And our clients were, we were sitting in a meeting, a community meeting with our clients, and they said, let's just go up there. Um, you know, they had this change.org petition had started with Elsie Herring from Duplin County leading it up. Um, change.org contacted us and asked us if they could, you know, do this. You know, 95,000 signatures in, in two and a half months. Um, you know, they said, let's just take this petition calling on EPA to come down to North Carolina, take it and deliver it to general counsel uh, and, and make them come. And that's what brought them down here. That's what did it. Um, so, I, so I just wanted to put that out there. And I also wanted to say for, to Donna, and you and I have started a conversation about this, but one of the, one of the you know, Native Americans in North Carolina are 2.38 times as likely as white people to live within three miles of a CAFO. And the statistics on the pipeline are even worse. And so this collaboration between EJN and you know, all the people of color and indigenous people in North Carolina could be just such a powerful thing. I mean, as the, as the lawyer um, you know, in these meetings, you know, that, I'm a, I'm an, I have an organizer background, so that's what I'm always thinking of is how, pow, how much power you have if we, if we put it all together. And that leads me to the last point, which is Title VI, and you know, Mark is sitting back here. We have used Title VI administrative complaints for housing, for I mean, for school education, for environmental justice. Um, you know, it is, it is. Uh, I, I am filled with despair about the administrative process, and and I hear us talking about how critical it is to use it, and that is absolutely true because it gives a voice to the racism. Um, it lets us talk about racism in a very real way. Uh, but it's only as strong as the communities that bring it and that keep it up there. And so we are looking at other, and, and the Chamber Center is about to dramatically expand its, its capacity and become a regional um, office. And so we are looking for these, continued these collaborations with Marion and other great national forces in the legal area, in the legal arena. Um, and that is critical. We have got to find, got to exercise brand new legal theories around this stuff. Because, uh, you know, the Clean Water Act, these administrative processes, these, these um, you know, hoops you have to jump through to even get a forum, even get a venue, even get a decision maker. We, we have got to break this down. Um, and so we're, I'm just inviting people who want to, and we're already working with a lot of our, uh, you know, fantastic legal minds on the ground here in North Carolina, <coughs> but we need to bring 
all of these impacted communities together uh, to shape this legal strategy because it has to be defined by your priorities. So that's great, the long comment. What a great idea. We should talk about that some more when we get into the fishbowl part of our program this afternoon. But what a great freaking idea. I would just say this. Do not despair, right? We have been through darker times than we are going through right now. I think the part that you left out of your comment is the importance of having enlightened people as regulators. I can't tell you how important it was to us to have Mustafa. I'm not going to say I talk to him all the time, but I might have talked to him on a regular basis, right, about we're doing this, Mustafa, and the folks in Uniontown need X, and I need you to drop the hammer on um, the Office of Civil Rights, and we dropped that hammer. We did, and Marion and I were fighting until the Wednesday of the last day of the Obama administration to get them to do right. And they did right for about two days, and then we got a new administration, right? <laughs> so it matters. What's going on in the North Carolina Ninth matters. It's connected to all of this, right? Who these people are and who they put in positions politically as well as civil servants to do their job. You, Reich used to be a, an enforcement um, officer and director in Diener, right? You think it didn't matter that somebody who was an environmentalist and who had a, a profound legal commitment to this work could sit there on enforcement actions? It matters. Line staff, it matters who these people are. So this is just a moment in time. And this moment in time is going to be over as, as long as we are connected to each other and we are organizing to take back our government and take back our democracy and make sure people get treated equally before the law, right? Omega has the last question. O Omega actually was, he was next. Okay, and Donna will have one of the last comments. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, this, this question is, is kind of directed to Marion. And can uh, it be short? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is related to something my brother, who is a, uh, a member of our Western Revitalization Association in Midland, North Carolina. He's an Army, uh, he's an Air Force veteran worked for Ray Kim for 26 years in California, North Carolina. He raised this question to the uh, senior policy advisor for the governor back in uh, October for the EJ Network. And we wrote this and sent a formal letter. The question of the level of vulnerability of these communities, regardless of what color they are, to um, nuclear waste. North Carolina was identified as a nuclear waste disposal area in 1986 by the federal government. They're still bringing nuclear waste. They buried so much in the ground, now they're burying it on top of the ground and wetting it down. We have a nuclear power plant that was almost breached during the last hurricane, by the way. It was on the news and it was off the news very quickly because it's not a Republican or Democratic issue. It is an issue that has a long-term major impact uh, and we know what nuclear waste, it stays around a long, 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 long time. And we have not heard anybody formally in my many years, except my brother, right, who's brought this as an environmental justice issue that needs to be addressed and put on the formal page because of the level of tragedy that can may take place, Fukushima, Nagasaki, Three, three Mile Island, et cetera. And I wonder if Earth Justice, anybody else, Sierra Club, has put this on your agenda to address it. Because he was very concerned because of his military experience that we're not talking about some of the issues that must be made <laughs> environmental justice issues. Thank you. Well, I'll start. I mean, we, we really have worked on this on the upstream side in terms of uranium mining on in tribal indigenous lands, um, which is very, very contaminated full and you're seeing all kinds of um, birth defects from children now and they've been exposed to the water, it's been contaminated. And then, yes, yeah, some of our folks in South Carolina worked very hard against the VX plant that was slated for Fairfield County, which was just simply not cost effective. But the ratepayers and the consumers are having to pay about $600 a year for a facility that didn't even get built. People relied on, um, you know, they built schools, they, they, built, they bought houses down there. So the cost-effective part, the upstream, the poison, and then the downstream, and then the cost for the consumer, the whole thing is built on from the Energy Act of 2005, back when Cheney was doing all of that. And 
they've got five hundred billion dollars. I mean, yeah, each facility proposal is like five hundred million dollars tax subsidies, um, incentives. This is a highly it's not cost effective. If the taxpayers didn't pay to prop these up, they wouldn't be even options. So there's a lot of ways to get at it. We are looking at a few ways. So I'll just add quickly to that, and I, I am not an expert at it, and I don't know uh, precisely what's happening in North Carolina, um, but I will say I am so glad you raised that question. Um, we do represent, <coughs> excuse me, um, communities in Chavez County, New Mexico, where uh, issues of hazardous and nuclear waste are very much on the agenda, and um, they are overburdened by a cluster of waste facilities without adequate say over the siting of those facilities, without adequate information in linguistically appropriate um, uh, formats. Um, you know, I think there are so many ways in which these are, uh, the nuclear waste issue is an environmental justice issue, where it's going, who has a say in it, the disempowerment of communities um, by not giving people a say, by not giving people information in their language, all of that has taken place in the context of Chavez County, New Mexico. And um, I will just say, in the environmental movement, um, you know, I was in a new office at Earth Justice that was in New York that, uh, that was only a couple years, open, uh, um, couple years open when I got there. And we sat not far from Indian Point. And Indian Point in New York is an aging uh, nuclear power plant that is going to be retired. Cuomo's re announced it's retired in 2024, some, some future date. It should have been retired long ago, in part because there is absolutely no way to evacuate that region. You're talking about the New York metropolitan e region. 25 million people. It is, a, and it's right near Asining. I mean, it's Sing Sing. It's, it's a ridiculous place, and yet it's not sufficiently on the agenda in the Green Movement. And part of it is the concern that um, people are focused on climate change rightly, but that doesn't mean we abandon the fight about high risk activities and where waste is going and the lack of say by people who are affected. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you raised the issue and I think it should be higher on the agenda and I share your concern. I'd love to talk more about it. I would just say that the, the Western Shoshone um, tribe and the Navajo <coughs> have been throwing down about this issue for decades, but they have really been the tip of the spear in really throwing down about these issues. But what is the role of tribal governments in relationship to the Department of Energy about storage and disposal? So while we're all sitting here um, and while we've been traveling here, this current administration is making decisions about storage bypassing the NEPA process and bypassing the public comment process and just going ahead and making decisions and storing nuclear waste and spent nuclear fuel rods. So, you know, when I, um, I try to be neutral, and most days I'm, I'm pretty good at being a neutral facilitator, but these people are evil, right? This, it's not just that I disagree with them. It's that they're evil and they really think that nature is a finite um, resource, which we all know it is not, right? So the, the, the cataclysm that we're facing by people making bad decisions and uninformed decisions and, and decisions based on who gets money and who gets contracts is really going to cost a lot of us our lives. And so we need to be linked up, as Elizabeth said, and thinking about creative strategies and also tearing down the barriers that have kept us separated one from another. I'm sorry, but I'm going to forego your, your question, but I hope you will come up and ask them. Give Donna the last word, and then we're going to break for lunch. Okay. And can, am I close enough? Uh, actually, I'm hoping that this will be uh, ending on a more positive note. But thank you, Vernice, for uh, raising up the ongoing battle that's been going on around nuclear, and thank you for asking that question. Um, one thing that struck me as a unifying point for all of us was the, uh, um, the encouraged benefit of mutual aid in our communities as we face these disasters and continue to face. And hearing the conversation with questions, I would add that we're also raising up the need for us to have the mutual aid society within our organizational structure. And that's happening on some levels, and it's increasing in some and getting less in others, which will always happen. But I think we should remember Remember that it's not just in local communities, but within our ongoing organizing work that we need to be mutual, mutual aid societies. But I want to I want to say this uh, because whenever I'm putting together a presentation like this, the thought 
passes through my brain every time, and it's a quote that said, and I almost believe it's propaganda, where we hear over and over again, we're better than this. How many times have we all used that? Raise your hands if you've ever used, we're better than this. Okay, speaking as an indigenous person, I don't believe we're better than this. I believe that this country is founded on this, that fake news didn't start with Donald Trump being the originator of fake news himself, but fake news started with the colonization of these lands from day one. So we are not better than this, but we can be better than this. I hope that that's what we take out of here, that we can be and we have been, as Bernice said so well, we can be and we have been better than this, and so that we don't lose the encouragement of our day-to-day -day work, that we remember there's a mutual aid society that's in this room and elsewhere, and that we can be and have been better than what we are right now as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please uh, join me in just thanking this extraordinary panel of women for bringing this, huh? This is just, this is just a little, little, little teeny insight into the work that these extraordinary, that these, this is my job today is as facilitator. But this is just a small fraction of the extraordinary work that these folks are doing and the organizations that they've been a part of and how long they've been at it. So I would just say to the young people, if you do not want to be in a battle for justice for a really long time, this ain't the work for you, right? <laughs> but if you can see the horizon and your heart gets filled, by doing work on behalf of other people to bring about justice, to enforce the law, to make sure that people are treated equally, then we have a spot for you. But if it's not about the long goal, this, this is not the conversation for you. But if you want to hang, you can hang with Donna for 40 years, right? You can hang with other folks who've been at this their entire careers, right? We were all organizers, right? We were, we were the college radicals, you can tell, right? And we're still raising hell, and I'm just saying to you, Hellraiser forever if you want to join this fight.